You all know I'm Carolyn Schwartz from all the pestering emails I've sent you. (laughs) But I'm modeling introducing ourselves so that everybody does when it's their time to speak. I want to welcome you to the second in our series of art exhibits at Bethel. Uh, The um, origins of this exhibit are related to Shirel, our singing group. My creative director, Janet Buckwald, and I were uh, sharing a ride to the Shirel rehearsals this past summer and talking about how were we going to keep the community engaged during this transition year. And so we came up with a few ideas. And then I said, you know, we just decluttered the loft. It's a beautiful space. How do we communicate, do not clutter here? (laughs) And that's how we came up with your precious or our precious legacies exhibit. So um, stay tuned. We're going to have a third call for submissions for our third art exhibit at Bethel because the art exhibit in the hallway has now blessed our existence for about six months and we're going to have a new exhibit. So we're going to call for submissions, and the theme is Do Not Stand Idly By Tzedek Tzedek Tirdof. So we welcome submissions that address making the world a better place. So I would like to introduce my esteemed creative director (laughs) and best buddy in these endeavors, (laughs) Janet Buckwald. And I'm going to give you this. So it's just wonderful to have this inaugural exhibit in this fabulous space. And we must give a shout out to Carolyn and to Dave Waldman. For for them, this was a labor of love and a labor of labor. (laughs) They slapped, and Bridget helped too. Bridget Hodder, everybody, our (laughs) esteemed member. (laughs) And Joe Samar helped, and great support from Jerry Kazin, VP of Cibor. And hands-on painting from uh, Debbie Young and Carol Scheingold. And Marjorie? Oh, no, Marjorie did. Marjorie, Marjorie is a huge help, just not in painting the shelves. Um, and I want to give another real thanks to Belinda Jentz, who took the portraits of the people and the objects, and also to Tim Alec our esteemed videographer, because if a tree falls in the forest and there's no video of it, it didn't fall. didn't happen. So our ritual objects are not merely vessels, not merely things that we use to celebrate and create uh, an atmosphere and a holiday. They have a much deeper meaning for us, both through their intrinsic beauty and their histories. And these histories are often informed either by the why and the how they were made or how they were passed down for generations and will be passed down in the future. And by sharing these stories, we really share ourselves. We share stories about us and we deepen our relationships to each other. And it's so appropriate that we share these stories in the space which hopefully in the future will give us more opportunities and a space to deepen our connections. So, Carolyn, will you please? So we now invite each of you, in order, uh, to present your object and its story. And um, while in my original email I said five to ten minutes, I think if we aim closer to five, it'll be better because it's a beautiful almost spring day out and I think we want to have some time to enjoy that. So I'd like to start with our blessed Rabbi Josh Brendel. Thank you. Should should we bring our objects forward? Sure. Mm. 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 Happy to hold it. Thank you. I won't step on the phone there. Uh, Give me a uh, a four-minute warning, please, or someone (laughs) with one minute left. So this is the object that I brought. 
It is from the exact, it, it is a goblet, a wine goblet, from the Royal Crown Derby Amari collection. Not this goblet, but a goblet of the exact same line and vintage was given to, pun not intended, was <laughs> given to my parents as a wedding present. And this was a kiddish cup that they received from one of their best friends. Through my childhood, we used it as Koseliahu. We used it as Elijah's cup. And it lived in a place of honor in the home. And we would take it out once a year and fill it with wine for Elijah. So beyond being just a beautiful object of, of inlay and gold and just gleaming light, I imagined it as a magic object as well because this was Elijah's cup. And who knows, maybe he would come and drink from it when I would go to open the door at the Seder. So throughout my childhood and going back home to visit with my mother you know, throughout the decades after I moved out, this cup was for me a symbol of inspiration, of family, and of wonder. Now, this particular physical object I have to share with you, I have only had in my possession for about four months now. I found it on eBay. As one does. And when I saw it, my heart leapt. I, I felt as though it were, were springtime, although it was the middle of winter. And I felt that, that thrill of magic. Here was something that I thought there was only one of. Surely there was no other kiddush cup just like this, despite the fact it was made by me. And when it arrived, I found tears in my eyes. There was a part of myself that connected with that youthful wonder and that, that promise of spring that Pesach heralds for us. So it's living in my office, and that's fully where I intend to keep it, because I want this reminder by me as I'm serving our community to have the joy, to bring forth the wonder, and to always, always welcome the outsider into our community. So this is not exactly my parents' Kiddush cup. It is not exactly a Kos Eliyahu. I look at this as a cup of freedom and the cup of welcome and the cup of hope. May we all drink deep in this year to come of all three. L'chaim. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, our next... Speaker Elaine Barnard Goldstein. Okay. Uh, this is a plate. Um, useful on those holidays when we have a memorial service and uh, we have candles for each of our departed no matter when they died. Uh, so uh, in 1997, I married the man who not only had everything, he would also sell um, five of everything if, if you were interested in them. <laughs> so um, uh, when the time came to get him, I think it was a birthday present, what in the world do you get? Such a man. So um, he had lost, unfortunately, a number of uh, family members. And if he counts his uh, grandparent, counted his grandparents, that made five candles. Uh, and we generally had some junk plate that we'd put all the candles on. And I thought, well, there's a plate for um, Havdalah. Surely there should be a plate uh, like this. And I called up an artist who had some connection to this congregation. Uh, I think her name is in the description there. It slips my mind right now. Thank you. Yes, Fran. Uh, and I said, do you have a plate like that? She said, no, but would you like to invent one? So I said, sure. Uh, so she asked what I would like. And I said, well, gold, it should say Zachor and should be round. Uh, and here it is. Uh, it served us very well. It used to have four legs. It does fairly well with three, but uh, then it broke here um, probably shortly after said husband died. So it, it was uh, kind of symbolic that the uh, 
uh, the Zachor was required because of a break in the family. Our next speaker, Bernie Horn. Do you want to grab your... Just having these here is uh, precipitated by the visit that we had from Simona De Nepi, who I don't know if any of you attended that, but she's the curator for Judaica. Oh, what? Oh, okay. Okay, I'll talk about it. Anyway, she's the, uh, Simona De Nepi is the curator for Judaica at the MFA, and I brought these to her to uh, sort of authenticate the family stories, and it turns out it's correct. They were made between 1850 and 1880, and very simply would have found their way to the Ukraine. Um, these belonged to my great-grandmother, uh, Golda Tversky, who married my great-grandfather, Rabbi Pinchas Averbach, around 1868. Golda died soon after giving birth to my grandmother, Esther Averbach. The candlesticks passed to Basya Averbach, whom Rabbi Averbach married after his first wife died. Rabbi Averbach was murdered on his 70th birthday in a pogrom in the Ukraine on the 15th of Iyar in 1918. The candlesticks, the candlesticks passed to my grandmother, Esther, who immigrated to Winnipeg, Manitoba with my mother, Bella, in the late 1920s. The candlesticks passed to my mother when her mother died in 1930. They accompanied my mother to New York City in 1941 and passed to me when she died in 2005 and we will be passed on to my daughter, Rebecca. I never knew any of my grandparents. They all died before I was born. And it matters that my mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother all lit, blessed, polished, and handled these objects over a century and a half. Here again are their names. Golda Tversky Averbach, Basia Averbach, Esther Averbach Shigol, which got changed to Shell, Bella Shell Horn, Linda Watson Klein and Rebecca Watson Horn. About the, about practice, I wanted to say one thing. My mother was incredibly fussy about lighting them at the exact time. Uh, for most of my life at home, my father, who worked six days a week, was not home for the lighting of the candles. He got home eight or nine o'clock at night on Friday night. And the the sense of time and connection with uh, with Jews that my mother felt it, um, had nothing to do with being compulsive about time. She uh, told a story of imagining God's perspective on the earth as all the Jews lit the lit the, the candles like a line around the globe, traveling around the globe, and it, that always um, meant a great deal to me. Thanks. Oh. Thank you, Bernie. I'm not sure it's, it's on again. I don't know if I'm still in it. It may have gone off. Everything can be edited. Not so. Still going? Oh. Yes. Go ahead. Our next presenter, Alice Waugh. <laughs> Anna Hoshuaris. <laughs> I will. I to get that's the special guest. So, yeah. Um, 
so this is obviously a kiddish cup it's silver it's not um, polished because I did polish it once and the kids were strenuously objected because that's not the way it's always been <laughs> so fine sure um, so where this came from was this was actually a wedding gift from my mother but it's very it's very odd because um, my mother was not Jewish had no clue about what a kiddish cup was she just ha happened to um, have this because I think maybe her mother had or maybe she'd bought it when she was younger they uh, were from Texas and they were um, got a lot of they had a lot of Mexican silver so I think this is probably Mexican silver but so it's supposed to be just a wine goblet but my mother um, um, presented it to us as a wedding gift I think on our wedding day and said you know here's this cup and I was they were like oh a kiddish cup and she's like huh <laughs> <laughs> oh okay great and we have used it ever since so, and this is um, I remember from from my childhood. It's funny. I've, I've never actually seen. It's, it's a, a matzah holder, and it's got three containers: one labeled Kohen, one labeled Levi, and one labeled Yisrael. And um, it just reminds me of my uh, my grandfather, who explained to me that we were just the lowly Israels, you know, uh, and the others were. But man, I remember, I just, I remember more remembering it and seeing it than actually having it used. Um, I think we used it a few times. I, it was just something that I always saw at my mom's house, well, where I grew up as well. And uh, I don't know, it just, it just brings back those kinds of conversations and those kinds of memories. And uh, so the, this is, we have like a yours, this is from Alice's side, this is from my side, and this is from us together. Special the, guest object, the Minerki. <laughs> uh, I forgot to submit this when we were, um, when Carolyn was soliciting things, and I forgot about this because we made, this was ours, we made it ourselves, Ben and I, on uh, 2013, which is the last time that Thanksgiving and Thanksgivinga, as they call it, and uh, this won't happen again until another couple of hundred years, I guess. Thousand. Uh, okay. Thousand years. It used to actually happen twice in the 1800s, but that was before they made Thanksgiving the last Thursday of November. So, um, anyway, so I th thought of Thanksgiving, and I said, "Oh, wouldn't it be riot to make a, a menorah out of a turkey?" So I, <laughs> I, uh, I approached Ben, and I said, "What do you think?" And and uh, you know, Alice, um, Alice found. This, uh, tacky Thanksgiving centerpiece. We yeah. can say that <laughs> because it needs to be tacky. Yes. To yeah. to do and um, we got a uh, cheap two and a half dollar menorah that I you know it's kind of like made out of pig metal. I took it down and you know sawed off the tines of the menorah and drilled out the turkey and epoxied them in and. <laughs> And then a, there's the uh, other thing. On the front, so it says, what, what came with it was just this, it says, give thanks. And then there's this little sash under it, so I copied the font with a Sharpie, and I wrote, for eight nights. So it says, give <laughs> thanks for eight nights. <laughs> so, and now, even though we're not going to have Thanksgiving again in our lifetime, he does, he does trot out, so to speak, for a uh, <laughs> special guest lighting, usually, each, uh, at least one night of each Hanukkah. <laughs> I'm having so much fun. I hope you are too. Okay, I don't know who's going to hold that because it's your turn. Okay. Marjorie Raskin and Tim Alec. No, I'm all set. So I think Tim's going to be here with me in spirit right over there. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you want to. This, at, as you walked in, you saw our quilt. This is. Um, um, I'm Marjorie Raskin. Great to see you all in person. It's really wonderful. Um, so the last time I was part of a show and tell was when I helped my son bring in the ducks we had just hatched at our house and we were going to his fourth grade class. We were both very enthusiastic about the ducks and I have to say I'm feeling enthusiastic today as well to share this with you, our hookup quilt. Tim and I want to let you know about our HIPAA quilt, which was quilted by artist Linda Levin from Wayland. Linda, our family friend in Wayland, offered to use her fabric for our wedding HIPAA. Linda's trademark 
at the time was to dye her own fabric, and I expected that she would use some scraps from her past projects and sew some pieces together for our hoppa. Well, to our surprise, she created a unique piece of original dyed fabric that depicted the textures and colors of the main rocky coast. Tim and I were planning, had our wedding in York Harbor, Maine. In July 1966, this wonderful hoppa quilt attached to the tip of four poles was held up over, I'm sorry? 96. 96. I'll start again so you can, so you can edit this. In July 1996, this wonderful hoppa quilt attached to the tip of four poles was held up over our heads by four special people. The silent message of the hoppa loudly declared that we as a new interfaith couple would rely on the Jewish heritage to provide an identity, a sense of belonging to the past, to the present, the future. The hoppa, the seven blessings, and the breaking of the glass under our feet provided comfort knowing that we had a tradition to rely on. For 25 years, our hoppa quilt has hung on our wall. Marriage, like the images of our hoppa, has been filled with warmth, calm, storms, and brightness. I'm grateful for Linda for creating our ritual object for us. Thank you. Our next presenter is Howard Birnbaum. This is my matzah plate, our matzah plate, and um, it's uh, it's one of the first memories I have as a child is uh, at my grandparents in uh, in a story in New York, and um, around when I was two or three, and somehow this is what I remember on the table. And uh, it, it, it lived there f- till my grandmother died, and somehow it ended up in St. Louis. Uh, and my grandmother gave it to my mother, and then when she moved to, Saint, uh, to Boston, uh, she gave it to us. And how did it get to be my grandmother Gussie, who brought it with a suitcase um, from a little shtetl? in Ukraine also, and um, I just knew this story of somehow that this plate looks totally brand new, and I turned it over in preparation for uh, trying to learn more about its history, and it was made in London in their mid-1800s, and so somehow it made it from London to Central Europe in the mid-1800s, to Brooklyn, to St. Louis, and now to Sudbury. Thank you. Our next presenter is Debbie Feldman. So I come from a family of people who like to make things. Um, One of the things that uh, my mother, my mother weaves, she does beading. I'm actually wearing a lot of things that she has made. Uh, As an example, this is my favorite. It's a little bag that she designed on both sides, and inside is a charm for my grandmother's bracelet with my name and birth date. She had, you know, all of her grandchildren um, on the bracelet. So around the time of my, let's see, my son is the oldest grandchild, and my mother had just sort of by happenstance attended an exhibit of ritual objects at her local Jewish community center in West Bloomfield, Michigan. And she decided she wanted to make a yad for my son. So she researched, she did whatever she needed, she found the form, and she um, beat it. Uh, 
um, which you guys can look at a little more closely. Um, and she made it. My son used it at his bar mitzvah, my daughter at her bat mitzvah, and we all use it every time we read Torah. So it's really become very special to the family. She did make one for my sister's family and my brother's family also, all, all totally different. So it's something that we just we think of her um, and we love it. So. <laughs> Our next presenter is Roz Grunman. Do you want so, me to attach it? Yeah. So I know people are showing things that are legacy, like you think of legacy as something passed from generation to generation. So without going into it, there isn't much at my house from the previous generation. And I didn't feel the gifts that were given to my parents from people who went to Israel were, I don't know. So this is a story of me and my first trip to Israel. I do have relatives there with my son Stash. So I want to predicate it that about half the people in here hear me talk about Stash all the time. And he is alive and well in Israel now with three kids. But this was when he was thinking of being in the Israeli army, and I was so glad when he was 21 that it didn't happen, but he asked me to come over and travel with him. So we spent a week, and the day that we were supposed to go up to Safat to be with people, we get out of the, you know, Lotan Hotel, and we get into the renter car, and he proceeds to put the wrong gas in it. Conk, conk, conk. Somehow he talks some dealer into giving him another car or something like that, you know, or <laughs> fixing it, whatever. And so, okay, we're on our way, and of course you have to stop to go to the bathroom, and it's the Dead Sea, right? And we're all excited, and you're just going into the bathroom, and you come back, and your purse is inside the car. Now what? Of course, the keys are there. So, go inside, and the guy say, you know, Break it, just break it. They're very Israeli. And uh, Stash wouldn't do it, unlike the normal Stash. He didn't want the trouble with the insurance. And he went, and I said, how do we get the... So the guy says, why not hire a taxi driver, go up to Tel Aviv, come back with the master key, because we've been on the phone about this. Okay, so this guy gets hired, but he wants cash. <laughs> okay, couple hundred. Okay, Stash is at an ATM, and somehow he remembers the numbers for this ATM account somewhere. And he gives it to him, and he says, cool, we're going to be fine. Now we can go over and get a really good meal at the really nice, you know, I can't remember it right now, but there's a beautiful kibbutz that people go over and have meals at that's very close to the Dead Sea and there's a little taxi cab that goes over there so he's just eating and having a lot of fun and all this kind of stuff and it's dark and it's Shabbat we're supposed to be in Safat to be with these religious people that are friends of our family in Safat so we've been saying Shabbat in Safat so we start seeing it again and we're heading off finally when the guy comes back with the master key and we actually are visiting a really well-known man who's a great photographer and um, they've held the Shabbat a little bit for us to be there and I got to see him and learn a lot at this dinner about his background and things like that and he took a little cup and he between the courses of meat and whatever, he did this cleansing shot. Of, and I didn't know that. And I, I feel like I learned a lot of things from him about other kinds of ways of practicing. So I had this terrific time with these, this, you know, these is real insight into Haredi people in Safat. And he was a really unusual man. 
from his journey through Paris and drugs and shows and these fantastic things I found out that he made. So in the end, I'm in looking for his store that he has that's very well known in Safad, his photographs, the next day, and I see this glisten on the street. And I felt incredibly lifted and heightened and very spiritual in terms of I made it to Israel <laughs> and I made it to Safat and I made it with Stash and one of the things I feel about this is life is a big adventure <laughs> and with my son it's a big adventure <laughs> and I just like to life it's such a great adventure oh. Oh, yeah. I'll take my leave of you. Our next speaker is Joel Moskowitz. Well, I, I also love those typical brass candlesticks that Ashkenazic Jews tend to have. But these are special to me because they're ceramic candlesticks and they're from Israel. And um, uh, I grew up uh, in a conservative Jewish family, politically and religiously. But my parents sent me to Israel when I was a teenager four or five times during four or five different summers to live on, the, on a socialist kibbutz. My, my uncle and aunt were founders of the kibbutz and they hosted me along with my, um, my cousins. Uh, and um, it was a formative experience. It kind of blew my mind to learn about uh, Jewish socialism. And um, my my uncle and aunt were very austere and um, strict about their uh, religious and philosophical practices. And but I they they loved me and um, I it meant a lot to me to be on the kibbutz. Ultimately, m one of my um, cousins was killed in a war. My uncle died and. Um, years later, after I had been feeling um, alienated from Israel, Janet and I took a trip to Israel. This was like 20 years ago, and we visited the kibbutz. And um, uh, my aunt was, um, hosted us for one, one night, I think, and the next day she took us on a little tour because we wanted to show Janet the kibbutz. And we ended up um, in their little uh, gift shop. And Janet and I were admiring these um, ceramic um, art objet d'art, which were made by one of the kibbutzniks. And we were milling about in the uh, gift shop while my aunt went up to the uh, cash register and just bought them without us noticing. And she... Um, then um, came up to us like I'm holding them like now, right now and as if they were like already lit and she gave them to us which was a total surprise because um, she wasn't into materialism or gifts or anything like that but she understood that uh, such things would mean a lot to us. Okay. <laughs> And our next speaker is Steve Bright. Do you want me? Do you want me to hold the family tree? Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. in the corner there. All right, so this uh, piggy bank came into my life when I was about 10 or 11, so maybe 50-some 50, 50 years ago. 
um, from my Uncle Werner, and uh, he said it had been passed down to the oldest um, descendant, bright, you know, with the bright name for a number of generations. And in fact, it's engraved, I'm going to have to try to read it here, uh, with Ignat, the first names engraved on it are Ignaz and Friedrich Bright Nimsch. Um, and, and it's not dated, but from the family tree, I know that uh, they are um, back here, and Ignaz Bright was born in 1812 and, uh, in Nimsch. And so then it was passed on through the tree. I'm, I'm down here, so here, here's where I am on this tree. And it was passed down, and each generation that passed it down um, engraved the names of um, mostly their, uh, when I don't know if it was passed down on the weddings, but it's always Adolf and Emma Bright in Tarnowitz, uh, Lothar and Minna Bright, who are my grandparents. I never met Lothar. He died in 1935, but I, I knew Minna, or Mickey as we knew him. She was just a, a really elegant woman, uh, one of my father's friends who's still alive in California. Um, described her he knew her in Shanghai when they were in um, in Shanghai after uh, during the war and described her as sort of having the bearing of a princess um, very elegant woman and Boyton uh, which is now Beetum and Polton and then it was passed on to my uncle Warner Bright and um, and he passed it on to me Stephen and Lisa Bright 1982 and um, so I, I just thought it was a piggy bank as a kid. <laughs> I had no idea. And my, my parents were, I'm not sure my Uncle Warner, who gave it to me, knew what it was. But I'm pretty sure it dawned on me one day after I'd been coming to Bethel for a while <laughs> that this is probably a Sadaka cup. And uh, so it's very, um, I don't, we have very little uh, that survived. The, my parents escaped from Germany. Uh, very few objects, but this one's particularly meaningful because of the uh, generations of brights inscribed on it. And uh, and so now um, I'm looking forward next uh, April, April 15th, 2023, of passing it on to my uh, son Raphael and his um, delightful, lovely uh, fiance Sarah. Um, and uh, having their names engraved on it and passing it on at their wedding reception to him. So that wraps up our wonderful presentations. I want to tell you about one other thing that you can keep in the back of your mind in addition to the upcoming art exhibit that we'll be getting doing a call for submissions. We're going to be doing some murals in the back uh, of Bethel, uh, of the building, to beautify the, the garden behind Bethel. And our leader in this is Linda Klein. Um, and I think she'd be open to having some partners. I think we're thinking of two or three murals. So if you are a mural painter or would like to try your hand at being a mural painter or know a mural painter, please let me know. So please uh, enjoy the rest of the exhibit, enjoy the hamantaschen, and uh, I thank my husband Dave Waldman for the strawberry jam in uh, half of those hamantaschen. <laughs> Oh, that's all right. Yeah. You know, this also has a